How's it going, everybody? What's going on? Oh, let me make sure. All right, there we go. Uh-oh. All right. Here we are. We got another live stream, another Eat Me, Make Family stream. Let's see there. We're live. How's my audio? How's my video? Everything good? I am not Durian Writer says... <laughs> says donate to Sverige. we don't want him to be homeless why should we donate to Sverige? i think he's doing all right isn't he Sverige. uh Sverige, i think is how you're supposed to say it i guess his real name is gatis funny funny guy um he likes to eat raw meat so we got the he's, he's not having babies though i am not durian rider says hey tristan <laughs> Durian Rider, you guys should see my uh, Durian Rider had a nice little exchange with me on Instagram. The lovely Durian Rider. Um, we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about practical implementation of legitimate nutritional principles to maintain human fertility, fertility in our minds and our bodies and in our culture. Cool shirt. Oh, beautifully mel melodic is banned. No, I'm kidding. Inside joke. I think beautifully melodic knows what I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, we uh, we've been talking about nutrition and physical degeneration from Weston Price. You can't see me. <clears throat> well, I'm wearing a shirt. Somebody knows that I'm wearing a shirt, so the stream's working. Ghost of John Moore down. Nutrition and physical degeneration. One of the most important books on nutrition and anthropology of the 20th century now this book in this book weston a price who started the american dental association was sick of drilling everybody's teeth he was sick of looking at the degeneration that you're seeing in so much of the western population the degeneration of the physical body as well as the degeneration of the morality of cultures was he proposed intimately tied in with nutritional practices so this is a really really fascinating book he actually went and uh, traveled all around the world and found primitive cultures native stock of people who were strong happy healthy you know living meaningful lives virile people living off the fat of the land every single one of these cultures used animal foods also, most of these cultures use plant foods to a certain extent. None of them basing their nutrition solely off of plant foods. And when they traded off their native foods for processed, refined junk food for the Western diet, they degenerated. Their faces became deformed within one generation. The dental arches were not properly formed. And they started getting dental caries. Their countenance changed. Crime would increase in their areas, and they would get massive degeneration. So the nutritional pr uh, principles that were being pushed on them in the colonial monoculture, the colonial junk food culture, were obviously not doing them too well. And we're seeing the same degeneration now. I live in a community where a lot of people think that it's bad to eat meat. They've been tricked by PETA. They've been tricked by nutritional charlatans who call themselves doctors. They've been duped by big ag, big pharma. People who don't even know that they're doing the bidding of big pharma and big ag. They think that they're being rebellious. When in reality, these people are doing exactly what the global elite want them to do. So we're looking at nutrition and physical degeneration. Fascinating book. Let's get into this. Let me make sure I've got I've got the mod squad out there. There will be trolls today. There will be trolls. And there will be bannings going down. I don't even know how to ban people on a live broadcast. So my mod squad, you got to do the job for me. Luke Rink says, is anybody on the carnivore protocol? 
consume 100% cacao with no side effects. It's the only food I miss. Dude, there is no the protocol for anything, for anybody. That's one thing that you're going to understand if you read this book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. There's no one way to go about it. You know, of course, ideologues out there will tell you this is the only way. You can only do, uh, you know, beans, lentils, and eat gerbil food. You can only do a, I don't know, a, a, a vegan diet. You know, I mean, obviously it's hard to resist when such virile examples of super male vitality out there are promoting these things. Such intelligent people who are in the process of buying their credibility and credentials. I'm telling you, you can do this, you can't do that. These are ideologues, guys. You can eat whatever you want if you can handle it. Just try it. So everybody waiting for Michaela Peterson. Michaela Peterson's coming on the second hour. That's going to be at 1 o'clock Eastern. Or I'm sorry, 2 o'clock Eastern, 1 o'clock Central, which is where I am. But here's a 100% cacao right here. I love 100% cacao, man. Don't worry about what other people say. Can you eat this or that on so-called carnivore? Well, why, what makes you think you have to do a so-called carnivore diet in order to be healthy, happy, vibrant? You don't have to do it any one way. You do whatever works for you, all right? So don't let ideologues get to you. There's a lot of people with some amazing stories on carnivore diets, but different people are going to have different sensitivities to different foods. And the goal is not to whittle down your food choices to the utmost basics and only eat that. That's really not what any one of these cultures that's lived without degeneration has ever done. None of these cultures are only eating a single source of food. Now, of course, when we've got rampant antibiotic use, loads of really, really degenerated people, right? People who are, you know, unable to digest nutrients and giving nutritional advice. People who are completely lost in the labyrinth and maze of nonsense information out there. And people whose guts are wrecked from glyphosate, from the low quality foods we've been eating, from wheat, corn, soy boy, soylent slap diets. A lot of our guts are messed up and we're not able to, to handle so many foods, but the goal is not to just whittle it down. So just try it out, man. If you really miss 100% cacao, which I love it, dude. I eat it all the time. I mean, I can handle other foods. I don't need to do 100% carnivorous diet. I find myself gravitating more towards foods like 90 percent of my foods being from the animal kingdom i don't eat very many vegetables not because i can't handle them just why would i eat them <laughs> why am i gonna steam up a bunch of spinach when i can have bone marrow why am i gonna have some of these silly you know why am i gonna worry about eating kale like it's some sort of a health food full of oxalates salicylates full of abrasive fiber that we can't digest when i can eat a bunch of steak with butter I mean, to, it's, it's, to me, that's, that's what's up. Like, but you know what? It's, it's different strokes for different folks. So, yeah, I, can you do 100% cacao? Totally. Try it out. Don't worry about what other people say you can or can't do. See what you can handle. See what you can digest. All right, let's get into nutrition and physical degeneration. We're talking about fertility practices here, guys. Um, fertility being a major issue these days. You know, the fertility rates are declining. Well, a lot of people are getting vasectomies. A lot of people are voluntarily sterilizing themselves within certain dietary religions out there. And that's kind of sad, ain't it? But also, the sperm count has decreased dramatically just since the 1970s. There's environment, environmental factors as well as dietary factors involved in this. We're avoiding our heritage foods. We're eating a degenerated diet of processed junk slop. And of course, this is resulting in very, very low fertility rates among people. I mean, people are trying to get pregnant. You know, it's a shame. So many people in my generation are going to one day decide to try to have kids, right? I mean, our daughter was born when we were, I was 24 years old. 24 years old when my daughter was born. And... I mean, I can't tell you how stoked we are to be, to be parents, to have a family. That's why we call it the Eat, Meat, Make Family stream. 
And our kid, our first kid, she started getting dental caries really heavily. We were on a vegan diet before we started out on our journey that led us here. We were doing a vegan diet. We were doing a whole foods based vegan diet. Somebody's asking if I could show a picture. You guys want to see? Let's see. You guys want to see a video when I was on vegan diet? Cover your eyes, children. You're going to see some some straight up degeneracy here. <laughs> Mushroom enthusiast. Yes, yes, yes. There's actually a big pile of, uh, I think it's reishi right over there to your right. And then this is uh, over here. Good stuff. Good. Lovely thing here. There's Jessica. I never knew what to do with it. Come down here and find the, the garden that is overflowing with all these huge eggplants. Yeah, for some people, they appreciate if you got measurements and stuff. But we're all about the There we go. So there's there's me on a vegan diet. <laughs> Sorry, guys. same hairline. You know that the vegans love to troll and say you're bald. I even had Darian Ryder, the lovely Darian Ryder, coming on talking about how I'm bald. Sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. Brian Scruggs. Darwinian extremist is on timeout. So there, there was me, super scrawny as an emaciated vegan. About four months after that, I nearly died. Literally nearly died after that. Um, just super, super emaciated. Hard to watch. Hard to see. Because it's like at the time when we first started... We felt so much better than we did on a standard American diet. You know, of course we felt better than on a standard American diet. Of course we felt better than we did on a standard American diet. So there, there it is, guys. Proof of my experience as a vegan. Now, of course, I don't have video of when I was actually nearly dying. When I got some sort of a bacterial, gnarly infection, couldn't handle it. My immune system was so shot, right? Even though I'm trying, I'm doing all these things like trying to eat a whole foods, vegan based diet, doing the quinoa, sprouting, <laughs> sprouting all my greens, sprouting nuts, vegetables, lentils. And I was never even a, vi a vegan ideologue, right? Like I, n I always knew that Monsanto, Big Ag, loves... These vegans, like I had talked to, you know, I had doctor friends and stuff who had told me about some of the horror stories of when vegans had come into their practices. You know, and in fact, I even have, here's a, here's a comment. I'm speaking about fertility, nutrition and fertility, and some of the practices of healthy native populations for fertility. So... Here's a comment from Monique. This was on a, uh, a photo when I was actually responding to Darian Ryder showing, I'm sorry, dude, my hair line has not changed since I was 20. And um, again, for those who missed it, oh no, look at those arms. <laughs> Just like my neck was so weak from, I, mean, <laughs> I wasn't getting proper nutrition. I thought it was great, though. I felt better than when I was on a standard American diet. But then you don't realize that you're just totally degenerating. Oh, it's normal. I'm getting detox symptoms. My, my joints are starting to hurt all over. I, I wake up in the morning with huge knots in my hip where I'd had an injury before, but the injury started feeling like it was getting worse. This is just a healing crisis. This is just healing crisis. You know, it's like when you lose your fertility, it's a good thing. It's a badge of honor. You know, infertility is a badge. Infertility, vasectomy, and losing your period as a woman is a sacrament. 
in the vegan religion. It is a sacrament. It is a sacred rite in the vegan religion. My doctor's clinic in Byron Bay, Australia is full of vegans, ex-vegans like myself. I can't tell you how many are in the IV room getting iron. I'll never forget the day a pregnant woman and follower of at Durian Rider and at Freely Official was carried in. She was white and could barely talk. The nurse gave her an iron IV and we literally watched her face change color and her mind come to life. Within five minutes, it was honestly like science fiction. She sat there elated and started crying. I've got my brain back. And then hugged. <laughs> she then, I then hugged her saying, I'm so sorry on repeat. It was an emotional scene to witness. Denial and defiance are allowing things. And I know from my experience, the lack of good fats, minerals, especially magnesium and zinc and aminos, and yo-yo ramped up insulin highs and lows that led to my fundamentalist thinking. Now I look at these guys, especially Robert Morse, and yeah, they really do believe they're right. The scary thing. The scary thing is that they don't even want to hear the real stories let alone take responsibility for the harm their message causes. There's some really dark days ahead for these people. Keep building the tribe, T. We made it out. So there's a former victim of this insanity. In Australia, this is really, really rampant. All right, so that's just one story of a woman seeing a pregnant woman taking the advice of these ideologues. Now, I've got a, I live in a community full of vegans and vegetarians, all of whose kids are having developmental issues, all of who are in massive denial about it. Consequently, now that we, we, my wife and I were talking about it with somebody the other day, and there's also a lot of uh, just emotional instability in these people as well. You'll see this a lot in malnourished communities. Now, I have no problem with vegans. Right, we're talking about the ideology behind it that's harming people, the nutritional principles behind it that are get, uh, uh, leading people into infertility, leading people to even desiring infertility, and sterilizing themselves, like Dr. Greger says. So let's look at some of the nutritional principles that Weston A. Price found in his book *Nutrition and Physical Degeneration*. You can get this book on Thrift Books. I should put an affiliate link for thrift books. Um, all right, so he's talking about some of the uh, the applications of primitive wisdom. This is one of the later chapters. It's a pretty big book, you know. I mean, I've gone through this <laughs> extensively and annotated it and taken a lot of notes for you guys, and we've been going through it kind of chapter by chapter, chunk by chunk. And I think some people are getting uh, starting to get the picture that when we go away from our native diets, that when we go away from eating foods from the animal kingdom. That we're designed to eat. Then we degenerate. Then we take advice from ideologues, from their idolatrous religions, telling you to abstain from meats, that it's unclean, that it's sinful to eat meat. We see degeneration in ourselves. All right, so uh, it says, I've presumed in this discussion that the primitive races are able to provide us with valuable information. They had straight teeth. They had straight teeth, beautiful teeth. You know, these were people who were not degenerating. These were people who were not deficient in nutrients. Of course, they were, you know, if you were to listen to the vegan ideologues, they're, they're just primitive idiots. They're fools. They don't understand the wonders of lentils. The wonders of the Gregor. The Dr. Greganator. I digress. In the first place, the primitive people have carried out programs that will produce physically excellent babies. They're making good babies. They're eating meat and they're having families, guys. They're maintaining their cultural heritage. They're maintaining the family unit as the center of their cultural heritage. And these people understand how to pass on to their children the wisdom that they require to maintain fertility and health. So they had carefully planned nutritional programs for mothers-to-be. It's important to note that they begin this process of special feeding long before conception takes place. This is pretty important for any expecting mothers out there. Really, really good book to look into. Um, this is one of the most important chapters, Application of Primitive Wisdom. All these groups 
Long before the woman would conceive, they would have special nutritional programs. All right, so it's important to note that they begin this process of special feeding long before conception takes place. In some instances, special foods are given to the fathers-to-be as well as the mothers-to-be. These groups of primitive racial stocks who live by the sea and have access to animal life from the sea, these carnists by the sea. I used to live near a town called Cardiff by the sea. These are, these are the carnists by the sea. They need to be educated, guys. They need to be educated by... They need to be educated by the enlightened vegan ideologues. They need to be educated by Goji Man. They need Dr. Gregor to come and tell them how to live. All right, so... By the sea, certain types of animal life and animal products, specifically the Eskimos, the people of the South Sea Islands, residents of the islands north of Australia, the Gaelics in the Outer Hebrides, and the coastal Peruvian Indians, have developed among them, uh, have, devel have depended <laughs> upon these products for their reinforcement. Fish eggs have been used as a part of a program in all of these groups. The cattle tribes of Africa, the Swiss and isola high, isolated high alpine valleys, and the tribes living in the higher altitudes of Asia, including northern India, have depended upon a very high quality of dairy products. Among the primitive Maasai in certain districts in Africa, the girls were required to wait for marriage until the time of year when the cows were on the rapidly growing grass and to use the milk from those cows for a certain number of months. order the order's a little off here guys sorry so here in Fiji the Fijian islands they would use the shell of a species of spider crab the natives use for feeding the mothers so that the children will be physically excellent and bright mentally physically excellent and mentally bright so really really important they found it really really important that they fed them certain animal foods Namely, certain crabs. And look at this beautiful woman. This Fiji woman come a long distance to gather special foods needed for the production of a healthy child. <laughs> These and many primitive people have understood the necessity for special foods before marriage, during gestation, during the nursing period, and for rebuilding before the next pregnancy. Because remember, the baby's going to take those minerals no matter what. Our daughter started developing dental caries right when they came through. After we were on a vegan diet, our second child, usually the second, third, fourth, fifth kid, gets the worst of the degenerative diseases. Usually the second, third, fourth, fifth kid has worse teeth and formation of the jaw. Our son had no dental caries. Our second kid. Had we known this, if I knew now what I knew then. But if I knew now what I knew then, I couldn't be here sharing this with you guys. So in the end, perhaps it's a blessing from the guy that keeps trolling his, uh, his Darwinian nonsense, his Darwinian theology. In order for there to be a blessing, something has to be blessing you. So anyways, we actually made this book, the Ketogenic Edge Cookbook. We focused on a lot of the principles that we learned from this. That's why we included lots of animal fats, show you how to make liver, heart, Using every single part of the animal is really important in all, these, in all these places because they wanted healthy babies. They wanted healthy children. They didn't want degenerate, insane people in their culture. They didn't want nutritionally deficient, violent psychopaths running their culture. They wanted healthy, strong, beautiful cultures. And it's their right to hold on to their culture. It's their right to choose what they put in their body and it's your right to choose what you put in your body. So again, it's not the, no problem with people want to eat any diet, but when you're enforcing that and trying to force this through legislation, taking kids' right to eat these foods away, taking away meat from schools, right? companies, corporations forcing these no meat policies, whole foods, 
having their plant-based fake protein section, their fart fuel protein, say no evil foods here. When there's this cultural zeitgeist trying to suppress our abilities and our desire and program us that it's unclean to even handle these foods when every single culture is eating raw meat. Yet people are afraid to touch a steak. So they'd secure special seafoods for expectant mothers to nourish the children. In the Fiji Islands, there was a particular lobster crab, which this woman believed and their tribal custom demonstrated was particularly efficient for producing a highly perfect infant with straight teeth, right? Not malnourished, with a well-formed jaw. Children who can formulate coherent worldviews and not sell out their culture to corporate ideologues, to the global mic culture. Both parents are eating liberally. Okay, so I, sorry, I skipped a section. Indians in the far north supply special feedings of organs of animals. Among the Indians in the moose country near the Arctic Circle, a larger percentage of the children were born in June than in any other month. So they would time fertility, they would time the cycles of birth in accordance with special nutrition available seasonally. You know, these, pe these people, they're not just eating the muscle meat either. They're eating liberally of the organs. So I got a squeaky door over there and the wind closed it for me. So this is the, in the moose country near the Arctic Circle. A larger percentage of the children were born in June. Both parents were eating liberally of the thyroid glands of the male moose as they came down from the high mountain areas for the mating season, at which time the large protuberances carrying the thyroids under the throat were greatly enlarged. Among the Eskimos, I found fish eggs were eaten by the childbearing women and the milt of the male salmon by the fathers. The coastal Indians in Peru ate the so-called angelote egg, an organ of the male fish of an omnivorous species. That's this egg right here. That's this egg. This is the angelote egg. This is not murder. This is not rape. This is the egg of a small skate-like creature. The organs were used by the fathers-to-be and the fish eggs by the mothers-to-be. Everybody actually ate of the fish eggs. And this is something you can still find in the markets all throughout the Andean regions of Ecuador and Peru. So this, it's not like a normal egg. This is, it's, it's got a real fishy smell. And when you open it up, you get this. So you peel off this layer of the egg. This outer layer, if you're listening to this later, if I put this up as a podcast or something, which I might, but I don't know. You peel off that outer layer, and the inside is this, and it's full of iodine. Now, in the Andes, the content of the iodine in the soil is relatively low, so they would use this stuff. It's got a very strong kind of almost ammonia smell, but this is just the raw fish egg. It's real hard. It tastes like fish. Who would have guessed? So this is not abuse. This is not murder. This is a human fertility food that's been used for thousands of years to maintain fertility throughout the regions of coastal Peru and the Andes. All right, let's go on. The Peruvians used fish eggs liberally during the developmental period of girls in order that they might perfect their physical preparation for the later responsibility of motherhood. The fish eggs were an important part of the nutrition of the women during their reproductive period. They were available. I lost my place. They were available both at the coast market of Peru and as dried fish eggs in the highland markets, where they were obtained by the women in the high Sierras to reinforce their fertility and efficiency for childbearing. A chemical analysis of the dried fish eggs that I brought from my laboratory revealed to them to be a very rich source of bodybuilding, minerals, and vitamins. Here again, I have found no record of their use in our modern civilization for reinforcing physical development and maternal efficiency for reproduction. So fertility, really, really big issue these days. If you look at all the foods that these people are eating, they all are based on animals. They're all based on animal fats. They're all based on foods like liver, heart, marrow, 
saturated fats, cholesterol-based foods, iodine, vitamin K, vitamin D, vitamin A, the fat-soluble vitamins that are not available in the plant foods that they eat as well. Now, none of these are going to avoid plant foods altogether. In fact, on certain islands, you find populations that would trade primitive races were dependent on three sources. All right, let's see. This is not the wrong page. Well, anyways, here's an interesting page anyways, talking about three sources of the fat-soluble the fat soluble vitamins, namely seafoods, the organs of animals, or dairy products, all of animal origin. So these are the fertility foods of all of these primitive cultures, all based on animal foods. So we've got to use fats. We need, we've got my dog. Going crazy. Just send him outside. He could walk outside, but he, he stands at the door and barks instead. Um, where'd it go? So animal foods being major nutritional factor in fertility foods of all these people. So for the ladies who are thinking about getting pregnant, right, we're all about eating meat and making families. Why is that? In order to maintain our fertility, our vitality, our strength, and our health, and our immune systems, we require animal foods. We require cholesterol. Do you need to cook them? A lot of people are asking, you got to cook them. You can eat them raw. Well, it depends on you. You know, I mean, I cook my steak. I, I love, but I eat it really rare. So I like cooked steak. I don't eat a bunch of meat raw. I'll eat heart raw, but not a lot of it. I prefer it cooked. I don't know. It just depends. Liver, you can do raw. It's more nutrient, more nutrient availability when you do do liver raw. What we like to do is take the liver and dry it in the dehydrator and then make pemmican with it. So that's one of the recipes we put in here. So there's an organ meat section of the cookbook, which we've got available in print now. I keep showing it. Or I spent over a year and a half making this book. So one of my favorite recipes is the pemmican with liver and heart. Simple nutrient dense whole foods recipes. There you go. There's a heart. That's food. That's not unclean. It's not dirty. It's not going to make you sick if you touch it. It's good stuff. Real good food. So, pemmican, another one of these fat based foods. It's essentially the fat, the suet of the animal melted down, which Jessica's actually rendering some tallow right now from some local grass fed beef. And you can melt that fat down and you can dry the meat. You can raw dehydrate the liver. How's it? You guys see the video? I keep. All right. Let me pull up the OBS so I can see. There we go. So we like to dry the liver, take it, slice it up, thin little strips, put it in the dehydrator. And we got a, the recipe. There's a recipe in the book too for uh, the crunchy liver chips. And I'm telling it to you right now. You could salt it. Put in the, in the dehydrator and dry it. So there's one of the things that, you know, one of the remnants of some of the things we learned as a vegans was the importance of using foods or the, port the importance of and the usefulness of rather. You don't need one, but the usefulness of tools like a dehydrator. Dehydrator, really, really cool tool to have around in the kitchen for drying meat. You could take an excess of meat like if you've got a friend who slaughters an animal and you've got a big surplus of meat that you can purchase and you don't have room in your freezer, you can dry a whole bunch of it, grind that up, melt down the tallow, put some salt in it. You could even grind up the liver with it and the heart with it, and you can have pemmican right there. It's really, really delicious. There's a lot of things you can do with these animal-based foods. Mr. Cass had pemmican yesterday, but the salted one was not so good. Ooh, I like salt. Chicken liver the other night was pretty good, says Ashley. You know what? I, I like beef liver a lot more than chicken liver. My favorite, though, is lamb liver. Lamb liver is so good. Lamb liver is my favorite. Compre el libro. Num sebo aquí no fresil. Oh, man. It's funny. When, when I read Portuguese, it's... I don't know how to pronounce Portuguese. Pero es muy similar a español. Even if you're not trying to make babies, having your fertility high is important for your sex drive. Exactly. You don't have to have babies to eat meat and make families. Right? Eventually, most of you out there, hopefully, going to be happy enough, going to have a 
coherent worldview to where you find it beneficial to have a family. Now, a lot of my generation is going to be realizing very soon, once they finally feel like they're financially, you know, everyone's so worried about money. Everyone worships money. Well, if I had money, then maybe I'd do that. <laughs> um, so they're spending all their life working in Silicon Valley, trying to make it big, find the next big IPO, right? Or trade in crypto. And make that mammon. But when they finally decide maybe have kids, they're going to realize the sperm count's so low, the women are infertile, especially if they've been doing vegetarian and vegan diets. So these principles can be really, really important. I mean, every single culture has used certain fertility foods, animal-based fats. Animal foods rich in iodine were important in the Andes, and they would trade for foods from the coast because you get low iodine content in the foods in the Andes. But of course, in the Andes, they had resources like alpaca. So they would be sending resources like fur, like woven garments made from alpaca and other foods grown in the high Andes, coca leaf, maca, and they would trade them for foods from the coast. Fatty foods like cacao, it's mostly saturated fat. One of, the, one of the few plant foods that I eat almost every day is cacao. One of the few fibery foods that I eat almost every day. So, you know, real basic foods, beef heart, liver, these are good places to start. I just like showing you guys this because they're so pretty, right? I just, they're such a beautiful thing. Uh, but yeah, you don't have to use the foods like this. In your local area, you know, um, seasonal butter, like they were saying in the Swiss Alps, that they would use the seasonal butter that was really, really rich in vitamins. So Weston Price says it's not necessary to adopt foods of any particular racial stock, but only to make our nutrition adequate in all its nutritive factors. So this was also helping to stop tooth decay. The stress periods of life, namely active growth in children and motherhood, do not constitute overloads among most of the primitive races because the factor of safety provided by them in the selection of foods is sufficiently high to protect them against all stresses. So they didn't have these same issues that we see today in our modern populations. They didn't have those same issues. Now it's funny because... <laughs> Among a lot of these crazy vegans out there in the YouTube vegan world, infertility seems to be all the rage. I'm going to have Michaela Peterson on in a few minutes. Let's see here. About 10 minutes, I'll call Michaela, and we'll talk about her story. Now, Michaela, as I understand it, now I don't know her full story. Hopefully she makes it. You know, sometimes there's... Sometimes things happen. If Michaela doesn't come, I'll have to uh, I'll have to do something else. But I think she'll I think she'll make it. But she went from super sick to having a beautiful, healthy family. She went from nearly dying, from having two hip replacements before she was even thirty, I think, from having the worst symptoms of arthritis that you can imagine, and through a very intense elimination diet that led her to like a full-on carnivore diet protocol, she was able to stop the degeneration in her body and actually be fertile and have a baby and have a beautiful family now. Really, really awesome. But it, to me, it's so, it's so crazy that, you know, I had to, I, I ended up, I edited this video a while back. It's called Vegan Revel. This is, I was thinking about becoming a vegan again. I was trying to hype myself up. Uh, so I found some of the top thinkers in the, the plant-based world, just the most amazing virile examples of plant-based goodness. And, uh, and I put together this compilation. So let's watch this. I'm going to take a little break from jibber-jabbering for a minute. Let's check out my, uh, my trailer for the vegan movement. Oops. we got to get some volume there. Being a full-time vegan, no meat or animal-derived foods like eggs or milk mean that a vegan's diet consists of just fruit, vegetables, grains, and nuts. It's amazing to see how much this cow loves being caressed after a rough start in life. Three point nine percent body fat, 
This is for vegan gains under the shower. Full netty swell gains, styrations in the shoulders, just ripping it up, ripping it up, shredded. I would be up for like three days on crack and then wake up like, let's go get some wheatgrass, and my man would be like, motherfucker, you need a straight jacket. <laughs> Bow down to offer respect. Fully topless with leaves on their nipples this is how silly humanity is. This is very, very important. Nipples are nipples. Nipples need to be understood. Nipples need to be actually understood and actually uh, broken the spell. I must be in the shame. Y'all get even. Y'all get even. Yeah, aesthetically even. Y'all, y'all come over this way a little bit. Here you go. If intercourse is communication between a group or individuals, then what is sexual intercourse? So sexual intercourse, just like when you eat food, you're having intercourse with the food you eat. We are immortal beings. The sperm comes inside of the body and is treated as a foreign entity. When fruit enters the mouth, it's natural. It breaks down and the body accepts it. When sperm enters the body, the body immediately rejects the sperm. You have to be vibrating at a low frequency to get pregnant. That's why when you become vegan or fruitarian, the sperm cell rate goes down. The body's Outcome becomes more outclined. Pay so attention. The system gets more stronger, making it harder. My boy Nature Man drop a science. So if the male is fruitarian, his sperm cell count, his libido even slows down. He's not horny like that. He's not really in his animalistic reptilian brain. He's activated his plant cell. He's become the, the tree. He's become the plant. His higher self. And his higher self, sperm cell rate comes down. Spiritual science. All of the trees and all of Vegan the plant science. life are immortal and asexual. If I gotta put somebody in check, last night it happened. Guy comes on a city bike, almost smashes the bike into me. I jump out the way and push him so he don't hit me. And he's like, yo, asshole. And I say, what, motherfucker? What the fuck is it? And he's like, yo, man, my bad. No problem, bro. Hey, man, no, no, Paul. This is not, this is going on. Oh, my one, two. Oh, 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 down. 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 Fucking down. 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 You step around and you grab it. The only reason why we have fucking global warming is because of people. It's a symptom of their fucking stupidity. People are the fucking cause and that is the fucking effect. And that's what's going to happen. And this is going to be the fucking payback. It's basically nature's revenge. The chickens and the pigs, they're producing and tons of... Nutrient deficiencies like causing seven, aggression, suicidal uh, ideation, yeah, violent yeah, behavior. Like, uh, no, hundred billion animals on Earth, and like, depression. So that means they're going to produce methane, which is ten times worse than fucking CO2. So it's best to just fucking stop having kids and we stop all the destruction altogether. Question for the day is why the fucking cunts care so much about themselves and not anything else? Why they fucking put their own fucking dumbass, fucking mongrel invasive fucking family thirsty for the native fucking species that are outside that should have a right to fucking live on that piece of land, hey? That's just a fucking abomination, a catastrophe that these fucking fools think that they deserve to live on this fucking paradise of a planet. They're just fucking idiots. Their kids are fucking ugly. They're fucking ugly. Girls, you heard it. What vegan birth control method would you recommend? Vasectomy. Hell yeah, baby. You heard it. You heard it. You heard it. <laughs> well, get on board. Come on. <laughs> yes, what I love you guys. What? When you get a vasectomy, no one can take advantage of you. You can even go to a bar, get blackout fucking drunk, Fuck a bunch of girls and you'll never get them pregnant. There are over seven billion more science already, and the numbers are growing. By vegan science. I think we're expected to have over nine. If, if you if you become yeah, vegan, it's your right to take a census of the world and decide how many people there's allowed to be on this planet. And that's why the people who continue to eat meat and dairy 
doing, even though they know the impact of their diet choices on the planet, on the animals, they've watched earthlings, they know the facts, they've been educated, but they choose to continue eating animal products. Whether they actually deserve to continue living. So obviously the load needs to be lightened on Mother Nature. What I propose is that Mama Gaia. a test. They need a license, a permit before they procreate, before they have children. They need to pass a test. And that men get vasectomies. So far, it sounds like veganism is just what we need to solve all the problems in the natural world. But what about you? Would you be a vegan to try and save the planet? So that's that's the enlightened vegan worldview, guys. The enlightened vegan worldview where humans are bad. Where let me see. Where humans are bad, and where when you become so enlightened, it apparently becomes your right to decide what people do with their bodies, what the, what they what they do with their land, if they're allowed to have kids or not. Now, this is absolute insanity right so anytime you hear these people talking about sustainability and diet what's sustainable <laughs> these are essentially just keywords used by authoritarians looking to take census of all the world's resources and control them now these people at the lower levels like these these freaking vegan ideologues they're just repeating shit that they've heard these people have no idea what they're talking about Who's ready for Michaela Peterson, though? All right, so we just talked about lots of principles for maintaining and gaining back fertility. Highly suggest looking back, looking into uh, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration by Weston A. Price. Um, also, you know, if you're just getting back into eating meat, which I know a lot of people watching this are just now leaving the vegan cult. Um, my wife's book, this was the result of us leaving the vegan nonsense, regaining our health, and regaining fertility. And also remineralizing our daughter's teeth. So it's all based on nutrient-dense whole foods. We got it in print now. Got to plug my wife's book again. Um, so that's available at the, on our website and the link's in the bio. Let's talk to Michaela Peterson. Michaela. Hi. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for coming on. Really appreciate you taking time out of your day and away from your family to come join us. We were just talking about eating meat and making families. Is this live? Yeah, this is live. Is that okay? Oh my goodness. Yes. I thought That's I was totally fine. Okay. I tried to be clear that it was going to be live. I, I try to. All right. Right on. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to, uh, first of all, thank you for coming on. Really, really appreciate it. And Let's see. Let me make sure I've got everything rolling here on the back end. Looks like we're good. All right. So, Michaela, um, how did you? How did this all start? How did you? How did you real like? I I know that um, you've talked about this so many times, but I kind of want to start from the beginning and just kind of hear about your, uh, you know, your your beginnings and how you grew up, what you were eating, and how you came to realize that a more carnivorous style diet uh was going to be the way for you to uh maybe regain your health so how did, how did this all begin um well as a kid i grew up with pretty much the standard american diet um my mom tried to be health conscious so there was a lot of like whole grains and brown bread instead of white bread and tried to not eat you know candy and all that stuff but at that time we didn't really know what eating healthy was um, I came to start the carnivore diet literally just out of desperation. I, I, did, I never thought this seems logical and this is a good idea. Um, I basically started with a keto diet, really, yeah. which I didn't even know about keto diets when I started. I just cut down to like very, very low carb coincidentally kind of. I knew, I figured nobody would be allergic to meat 
and nobody would be allergic to like carrots and yeah, right. all those kind of things. So um, I started that. The reason I guess I'll get back into the reason behind why I looked into diet and that was because um, I suffered from an autoimmune disorder, idiopathic arthritis. Yeah. Um, when did you get diagnosed with that? That when I was seven. So I started showing symptoms when I was two. And the actual diagnosis showed up when I was seven. Okay. You know, I, I, I've, I think I've got an audio sync issue. Let me just reload the stream real quick. Sorry, Michaela. Okay. Okay. Let's try that. Um, that looks better on my end. Okay. A bit. Oh, no. No. You're still delayed. Oh, no. All right. Let's see. Let's see what's going on here. Sorry, everybody. We were doing so well when it was just me. Um... Let's try, let me just try reloading OBS real quick. I'm just gonna close it, crease. I'm trying to figure this thing out. There's all these like little settings in the back end and I'm just not, I'm a really insufficient nerd today. Let's see. All my years of vegan diet left me so depleted mentally that I can't, I can't do this right. Okay. All right, <laughs> now let's see. They say I'm about two seconds delayed on audio. But whatever, we'll see. It should be good now. Um, all right, so you. It looks good on my end. Awesome, awesome. So you're you're a kid and you got diagnosed with an arthritic autoimmune condition. How the heck does that happen when you're so young? I thought that's, you know, you're supposed to get this when you're older. Yeah. Well, it took a while to figure out what was going on because it's not particularly common in kids. Although it's not as uncommon as you'd think. Um, but technically, back then, I was diagnosed with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. That was when I was seven. And then when I was so 19, crazy. the diagnosis changed to juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Wow. And what's the difference between juvenile arthritis and idiopathic arthritis? Well, idiopathic arthritis literally just means we don't know why, but you have joint swelling. Oh, wow. So they're just like, let's just screw you up more mentally and tell you we have no idea why this is yeah. going on. Like, let's just yeah. let's mess you up a little bit more. That sucks. Yeah. Seven it's years old. word for it. That's crazy. Seven years old, arthritic symptoms. Like, what do you remember what that felt like? I mean, I kind of remember what it was like to be seven. <laughs> um, yeah, not really, because rather than being in pain, generally, you just do things to avoid the pain. So I did things like I'd, I stopped going down the stairs one foot at a time and just went down the stairs, stopped going down the stairs, yeah, one foot after another and just went downstairs like one foot at a time because my big toe was really swollen yeah. or I started walking really slowly, but it wasn't, like I don't remember, I don't really remember pain, I just remembered I stopped doing things. Yeah. So it was more obvious for my parents than for me. Right, so like certain developmental processes kind of like slowed down? Yeah, yeah, especially you know running around, wow. mainly that. Wow, and and um, so seven years old, and then you got the diagnosis, and was it kind of bad? Like from the time between seven years old and nineteen years old, was it? Uh, how was it? Um, I was put on immune suppressants when I was eight, and I pretty much went into remission. I had some active joints, but I, everything was pretty much under control. Uh, and then when I was, I'd have, you know, some shoulder pain sometimes or a sore knee or a sore hip. But then when I was 16, my hip and ankle just, for whatever reason, the arthritis got significantly worse. And I lost all the cartilage in my right hip and left ankle wow. uh, when I, between the ages of 16 and 17 and ended up needing a hip and an ankle replacement. So that was when I was 17. I think I'm back now. I just restart every time. All right. Only I'm out of sync, but you're good. Oh, that's perfect. All right. I'm sorry, Michaela. All right. So immune, back in sync. immune suppressants is an eight-year-old. That's insane. Yeah. So I was the first kid in Canada to be put on um, a drug called Enbrel, which is a, a biologic. Wow. And it was for like what it was overwhelmingly successful, except that when I was 17, I ended up with no cartilage and two joints. <laughs> Yeah, right. it's what, and those are the kind of the most important joints in your hips, right? You know, well, the ankle, I would trade an an ankle replacement for a hip replacement any day. Yeah. Oh man. So when did you get your? You had a hip replacement, right? Yeah, and an ankle. 
That's insane. So both hips or one hip? Just one hip. Right hip, left ankle. Ah, oh, you're, f- you're fine. You got one. <laughs> <laughs> That's so nuts. And your, your parents, were they freaked out by this? Well, yeah, it was really scary. I mean, they told me like before they, they did an MRI on my hip and they thought they saw necrotic tissue, so literally dying tissue on the hip joint, which turned out that wasn't the case, thank goodness. But yeah, it was a terrible year. I was on a really high dose of OxyContin from January 2009 to January 2010. Oh, it was a rough time. I missed a bunch of school. Yeah, no way. I mean, how old were you then? Uh, 17. 17, 2009, 2010. Okay, so you were born in like 1990? Two. 92, okay. That's when my... Oh, no, my brother was 93. Okay. Man, so 2000... What different days back then? 2007 to 2010. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was not It was not pleasant, yeah. obviously. Yeah, so Oxycontin... Um, did you have and you came off of that as a teenager yeah it was it was very unpleasant like i was put on so first off i had a hell of a time getting any painkillers because people are obviously scared to prescribe painkillers to somebody who's 17 but i was in excruciating pain so eventually i was put on them and then i was at on such a high dose because of how much pain i was in it yeah. wasn't as difficult I just I didn't enjoy it. There was no no like it's, it's high like this that for I was it. enjoying. Yeah, it's it's yeah. I remember I used to I had you know scoliosis and stuff, kind of degenerative disc type. You know, I had a lot of pain and I was in college, and no doctor would prescribe to me any drugs as well. So I used to recreationally get even I was medicating myself, but I would get oxycotton, and I remember the feeling of like. Just uh, it, it was a dysphoric feeling, a very unhappy feeling, and um, oh yeah, and the it's dosage nice. would have to increase to decrease the pain. Uh, I remember using uh, morphine tablets as well and liquid morphine, just like trying all these things to try and decrease my pain, and it uh, it you know de- definitely didn't help with anything, <laughs> um, like no, and any level you know, and it just made me feel so so bad, and the digestion too, you know, the constipation issues that it'll bring about. Mm-hmm. H- hunger drop did you have like low hunger at the time honestly i can barely remember the year i was yeah. on such a high dose and then i was like i was on high enough dose that i was passing out so then i was put on ritalin to keep me awake <laughs> so it was a rough time gonna balance and, you out there wow yeah which actually you know there weren't that many options and yeah. it actually worked fairly well but my short-term memory for that year just was fried and it took a number of years to recover yeah did, did all the kids, yeah. did your friends try and get drugs from you as a kid? <laughs> no, no. Uh, I could just remember myself and the kids that I knew at that age would have probably been like, Michaela's got the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Man. Yeah, it was a rough year. And then, all right, so 17 years old, that was when you had your hip replaced? And then after that, um, like, when did you, like, did you have digestive issues at all during, during any of this or... Did, like, food ever come to your mind? Probably, but that was it. Like, I never had stomach aches. I mean, now I know looking back that I was bloated, but I didn't know that at the time. Like, there was no variation, and I had no pain, no stomach pain, so I didn't even think to look at diet. I never got a stomach ache. So I didn't consider it at all until I was 22. Why did you consider diet at, at 22? You, you mentioned your mom maybe had looked into it. Well, no. I started getting so my I kept getting sicker and sicker. And in college, I got way sicker really fast. Um, and I ended up getting these rashes, and they weren't healing. So I had, like, cystic acne and rashes. Eventually, that was around 22. Yeah. And my skin stopped healing one Christmas. And so I was just left with like wounds wow. that wouldn't heal. And that was cr- over Christmas. And I went to a bunch of doctors and they said, like, we don't know what's going on. I just, and that, what a, what a trip. So what, how did you feel about doctors at this point? Like, how did you feel about the whole, like that whole situation? I still had, like at that point, I still had a lot of faith in the medical system because I was, I was still on antidepressants for depression and was like, you know, 
and I knew that they helped my depression. So I still had a lot of faith in the medical system. And I thought this is as good as it gets. I'm just really unlucky yeah. uh, health wise, but at least there are doctors and medications to help me. But that year, especially after the skin thing, I went to one dermatologist who suggested that I was wounding myself. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And that didn't make me very happy because I was like, really, I'm dealing with all these health problems. And then you're suggesting I'm like, thanks, like inflicting these on myself. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. Right. And you're like, maybe, maybe even considering it at the time, like maybe like so, de- I mean, you know, I mean, having so much yeah, pain yeah, yeah. and I, I mean, I remember when I was a kid, did you guys have to watch those stupid freaking movies? Like they show you those movies in health class about like how to cut yourself and like how to fake suicide. <laughs> oh my God. No, where did you go to school? In California, we watched all, it, I mean, they weren't explicitly, but it was like, we're going to watch a film today and it's really important and everyone's like snickering and the, and the movie's just about like some girl and she's depressed and she's like, well, now I'm going to be anorexic and then she becomes bulimic and she gets all this attention from her mom and in the end, everybody loves her and she stops being bulimic. But it's But the whole message to me was like, well, yeah, if you get an eating disorder or you self-harm, you're going to get the attention that you want. <laughs> it's like... I, I, I don't know. It was just this weird cultural phenomenon to me that didn't really make that much sense. Yeah, that doesn't sound like a useful video. No, definitely. Especially I mean, to show teenagers. Yeah, no. I, mean, I, I Maybe I was a little cynical at the time. I'm not sure how other kids received it. But that was like, I thought it was some weird subliminal messages I was receiving. Of like, yeah, if I was a girl, I don't know how I would, you know, I would I would been totally thinking about this is a good idea. That's crazy. So the doctor says, oh, yeah, it's your fault. Maybe you're just like opening up these wounds and. That's why they're yeah, not yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, kind of, especially considering I did suffer from depression. And so now I know when I have these food reactions, all my symptoms flare. Yeah. So when my skin gets affected, my anxiety levels also rise. Yeah. So when I went to the doctor and I was saying, like, what the fuck is wrong with my skin? Yep. Um, I was anxious and angry about it, obviously. So they were probably looking at me like, oh, she's a bit unstable. Maybe this mm. is just something she's doing. So that's when I started being that made me mad obviously and worried because I was like, well, what if, you know, what if this is just me somehow, but then it turned out it wasn't. So that's good. But, um, I started, look, I looked into, I came up, finally came across after like two years of Googling this stupid rash, I came across pictures of, um, the celiac rash. Yeah. And it's this itchy blistering rash. And I was like, Oh my God, that's, that's what I have. And then I got my genes tested and I have the celiac gene. And so then I started looking into eliminating gluten. I eliminated gluten right away because I thought, well, maybe that's what's behind my arthritis as well. I never thought that food would be behind the depression and all the other things, but I thought maybe the arthritis was associated with it. So I went from eliminating gluten to an elimination diet and then eventually ended up with just beef yeah. and salt. So you went out gluten, and then you you mentioned like you kind of you ended up kind of do I guess uh, what was it called uh, the gaps diet was that it like did you ever look into that gaps No, so I didn't I really didn't know anything about diet at all. So I cut out and I always thought it was for quacks yeah. and uh, and people taking advantage of sick people. Yep, that's just what I thought. Like, there is a lot of that. Wow. You see that like people start yeah. whole cults. They tell people just eat fruit, and then they start like. You know, then it becomes this polyamory cult where everyone, they just keep everyone on mangoes and just like, hey, I got five girlfriends now. They all eat mangoes and they can't, they slur their speech and they're falling over, but it's, it goes down. We were just, before yeah. you came on, I was, we, were, we were watching some YouTube videos of some of these cults, but um, yeah, it's there's a lot of quackery. I could totally, I thought it was wacky too. It's like, why would I ever, I don't need to change my, I thought I was okay. I just thought it was normal to feel well, like I wanted to drink beer and eat Ben and Jerry's all the time and have like itchiness in between my legs. It's like I thought that was just like yeah. normal. It's jock itch. It's, it's fine. I'm a jock or whatever. Like I wasn't a jock, but it was just like you know I had you know my feet are itchy. Oh, it's cool. My mom had foot fungus too. I never thought that this was you yeah. know <laughs> me reacting to perhaps like what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. And if you have a name for it, like that seems to make it okay too. Mm. Like one summer I went away and I started eating these citrus fruits I hadn't been eating and I got little tiny itchy blisters on my fingers. And I was like, okay, that's definitely not supposed to happen to a human body. Like (laughs) what's going on? And I Googled and Googled and Googled and Googled and I came back with, oh, what's it called? Dermatitis, 
I don't oh, I, now I can't remember. Anyway, it's there's a specific name for the, the type of uh, dermatitis it is. And so people were like, oh, well, it's fine. It's just that. But giving it a name, <laughs> like, that doesn't oh. help. Yeah, no, you just have IBS. You just have irritable bowel yeah. syndrome. And if we can't yeah. figure it out for long enough, and if you're bleeding enough from your butthole, we'll call it irritable bowel disease. And then we'll give you some immune suppressants. We'll give you some antibiotics and... Maybe you could start eating lentils again, and if you you can eat lentils, then I guess that you're you're healed. But I don't. It's crazy. There's there's all this nonsense. So, wow. So all right. So then, um, so you started cutting out all these foods. You ended up. What was the? Let's go through the progression again. So it was like gluten. Okay. So you went gluten free. Now you're now I you're gluten free. Yeah. Now you're like plant free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's been quite a trip. So I went gluten free because I could actually find some hard evidence that gluten isn't good for you. Yeah. And I, I looked at the studies, um, and I thought, okay, this actually makes sense. So I, I cut it out. That's when I still was very science-oriented and needed hard facts. So I cut that out, and it probably improved my symptoms by about 10%. So yeah. not a whole bunch, but I was like, okay, maybe, right? Maybe it's placebo. Maybe I feel better. And then in September, I went on an elimination diet, and... At this point, I didn't know about GAPS or SCD or Whole30 or, or Keto or yeah. Paleo or, or anything. I went down to meat and fish and carrots and sweet potatoes, broccoli and rice just because I thought those were – It's like a, a bodybuilder diet. You know, I mean that's yeah. like a real yeah. basic, you know, like the Arnold Schwarzenegger diet kind yeah. of. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And that month, so that was September. And so at this point I had stopped taking my immune suppressants because I wanted to monitor flare ups to see if, uh, any of these arthritic symptoms would change. So I'd already stopped the immune suppressants, but I was still on Adderall for my, I had been diagnosed earlier that year with idiopathic hypersomnia. So I was just sleeping all the time. Oh, so I was on Adderall for that, and I was still taking antidepressants, and I was still taking antibiotics for my skin, and Tylenol three for like pain, partially because of my ankle replacement. Man. But so just Tylenol, pain. yeah. So it's like kind of attacking the liver a little bit there with the Tylenol. Yeah. So I was still taking a whole bunch, but I had dropped the immune suppressants, and then in that month when I went on that diet, like my skin healed and my arthritis went away. Wow. And, and, and then I tried to introduce banana, like sugar-free, gluten-free, dairy-free banana bread muffins. Mm -hmm. And I had, oh, and so I had a couple and they were very tasty. And I woke up the next morning, my wrists hurt. And I was like, oh, maybe there's something to this. But I had a couple more because they were good. Yeah. And two days later, I couldn't walk. My knees were wow. so bad. And so that, so then I really jumped into. And that's the only symptom? There was no like, you, did you get gassy or anything like that? Or you just, just that symptom? At that point, there was the only thing. That was my only symptom then. Yeah. Things got a lot weirder later, but at the very beginning, it was just the one I remember noticing. Like, at, the one I remember noticing was the arthritis. Yeah. Um, so then I went back to my, like, random elimination diet, and eventually it took me about five months to figure out rice was a problem. Um, and throughout the next year, I kept trying to reintroduce foods. Yeah. So eventually uh, I... I cut rice out, but I tried to reintroduce soy right away because I didn't know soy was one of the things you shouldn't eat, like a big one. Uh -oh. um, I just, I thought that was like a health food and I really liked it. What, so, what did you like? What soy? That's so funny. You went from missing soy to like Mrs. Steak. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, well, first, first I tried to re wow, it's such a funny... This is really when I had no idea what I was doing. So I was really sugar craving right at the beginning. Uh, and it had been a month. And I tried reintroducing Sour Patch Candy. Oh, yeah. Like you got the essential nutrients. You need the gelatin. 
<laughs> there was one. I looked at the ingredients, and I was like, okay, there's no gluten, there's no dairy, there's no grain. Yeah. It's just sugar, like, basically. Um, anyway, that really didn't go well. I ended up with an entire, like, my whole body itched, like, an Whoa. incredible itch. Yeah. Um, and then I started getting, like, skin problems again, and so I was like, okay, so Sour Patch Candy's out. And then a couple weeks later, I tried to reintroduce cheese, and I had a terrible, I had like a lactose intolerance response, and mm. I've never been lactose intolerant, Yeah. which was, oh my God. <laughs> I you sound I traumatized. You sound literally traumatized by this. You sound more yeah. emotional about your response to this than having hip surgery. You're like, yeah, hip surgery, whatever, uh, but <laughs> dairy. <laughs> dairy. Well, uh, yeah, actually though, it was, it was terrible. I had taken like um. Oh, so the other thing I so I used to take Adderall during the day to stay awake, and then I take gravel, just that anti nauseant at night to go to sleep because it's hard to sleep on Adderall. Yeah. Um. So I had eaten a whole bunch of cheese, taken two gravel, and and like passed out, and I woke up with like such a stomach ache that I woke up throughout the anti nauseant, and then, well, felt like dying for a while, and then the next, <laughs> and then it turned out like looking back, my depression flared after that too so it wasn't mm. just like a horrible digestive distress and nausea and all that mm. but um the next day i was miserable and i was still on antidepressants so i didn't really recognize this as a my depression changing i thought i was just really upset that i couldn't eat cheese anymore <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so that was one of the first things i tried to introduce i tried to introduce almond butter and it went badly and then in november so that was September to November. And then in November, I stopped the introductions for a while. And my depression started to lift for the first time in my entire life. Um, and within a week and a half, I stopped taking my antidepressants. And I was taking a lot of antidepressants. And I went down to none wow. really quickly and really easily. Because so, and... so many people have real issues coming off antidepressants, antipsychotics, and stuff like that. You know, really bad withdrawals. Yeah. So I had tried tapering down when I was in college and I wasn't able to, it was too unpleasant, like withdrawal symptoms and mostly mood, just severe mood problems. So I couldn't taper down in college. Um, but then when the depression actually lifted, I didn't have a hard time getting off them at all. And I felt better than I'd ever remembered feeling. Um, and at this point I was still taking, so now I was off immune suppressants, antidepressants, I stopped taking Tylenol 3. I was still taking Adderall at that point. Um, and then in December, I tried to reintroduce soy. And I had, like, I made my own miso soup, so it was gluten-free. Yeah. And I had edamame beans and tofu. I literally ate soy in every form possible because I was craving it so badly for weeks. Yeah. I had this huge meal, and then that was probably one of the worst experiences I've ever had depression wise in the next couple of days. Like first I got a major stomach ache immediately. It was like 20 minutes later and I was like, okay, this isn't going to work. And then four hours later, my entire body got itchy and I was like, okay, that's, that's not so ideal. freaky. The, the whole body being itchy. That's, that can't be fun. No. And it's, it's like from the inside out. It's itchy. No, it's like on the outside, like mosquito bites. Wow. So, and I'd had that for a very long time, but it had gone away and then it came back with soy. Um, and then the next morning I woke up and my depression was just back full force. And I remember like I got into the shower and just like bawled and was like, how could I be so naive for thinking that something as horrible as this could be so easily treated with diet, yeah. right? But so then I, I kept having to remember, okay, you were fine. Then you ate a bunch of soy and then you had this huge stomach ache and now you're itchy and depressed. Yeah. It's probably the soy, but it was hard to convince myself of that because it seemed so unlikely. And then I had like the worst month because I was also off of antidepressants at this time, but it was worse than I had experienced and it took three and a half weeks to go away. Wow. What did you do for those three and, and a half weeks? You just kind of hole up in the house or I, I yeah I like hid under my blankets and smoked weed yeah for sure and that weed doesn't really help with depression for me 
I know if I get depressed and I smoke a bunch of weed, it, like it'll there'll be an initial period where it's okay, and then it's just like the darkness comes back hard. So, oh no, I was a lot of weed. It was like enough so that I couldn't see very well. Okay. Like I guess that'll I, do it. <laughs> oh yeah, it was, I didn't do anything for yeah. at least two and a half weeks. I literally just oh, stayed huddled in a blanket. It was horrible. It was so frightening. Um, yeah, and it was yeah, and then so then for the next basically year. I would just repeat that, introduce something, have this terrible reaction for three and a half weeks, get better, be like, oh, good, I'm better again, reintroduce something, because I didn't know what I could eat. Yeah. I just did that over and over and over again for almost a year. Wow. And um, did you get scared? Like, did you ever think, well, maybe I'm placeboing myself into, you know, because I, can, I know a lot of people who get freaked out about various things. And even, you know, it's the human mind is so powerful. Like we can really freak ourselves out. I'm sure you kind of went through the thought process a lot of like, all right, I'm going to try this. I'm not going to freak myself out before I try. I mean, did you have like a process of initiation before you tried the foods to try and make sure that you didn't just placebo yourself into the reaction? Oh God, it wasn't placebo. The thing is, it wasn't just a depressive reaction. Yeah. Um, so the depression would hit, then I'd get lower back pain, I'd get itchy, my skin would break out, and about a week later I'd get arthritis. Oh man! So it was like it was a my all my symptoms would come back, except it's like except, a like a week long pulsation pain in like every single system, right? Like that's so crazy. The arthritis hitting you in a week. Yeah. So my it would take a week for my skin to break out, and it would take just over a week for the arthritis to come back. The depression is what the itching would start first, yeah, and the depression would hit right pretty quickly too. But the arthritis um, that took a while to come. Yeah. Yeah, it was very difficult to believe, really. Um, very difficult to believe. The only reason I stayed well able to believe it for that year is because I kept a really detailed food journal mm -hmm. where I circled like you know my level of arthritis, my level of all these symptoms. So I could see the pattern because otherwise, you know, if you eat something and then you think, okay, that, well, that was two and a half weeks ago. It's really hard to convince yourself that that's still what's causing problems. Right. Oh man. So yeah. you still have the journal? Uh, yeah, it was just on my phone. So, that's so cool. Wasn't Should... that fancy, but yeah, I do. It's... Yeah. Save that. You'll look back at that in like 10 years. It'd be an interesting artifact for, you know, show your daughter. Yeah. Look what you're able to avoid. Because <laughs> she... I won't feed you sugar. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So you're married and you got a kid now. Uh, or, I, yeah. or maybe not married, but you have a kid at least. Yeah. Um, were you with your, uh, your your husband? You with him at the time? Like through all this madness, all this pain? and. Yeah. Yeah, I was. And um, it turned out he suffered from depression as well. So it took me a long time to... Like, he was incredibly supportive, which was amazing, yeah. considering what I was going through seemed really unbelievable. And eventually I got him to cut out gluten, too, because I was like, it's probably contributing to your depression. And he, he did, eventually. And it turns out his depression is also manageable with diet. So he's doing the same thing I'm doing now, which yeah. is just beef. All right. So you found yourself – you didn't you, – what about fish? No, no fish. When so you eat I fish, do you get a reaction? I haven't actually... Okay, so what happened when I cut... I'll rewind a bit. So a year after all these food reactions, um, I decided I wasn't going to reintroduce anything, yeah. considering I knew the foods I could eat that didn't cause these horrible You're like, reactions. like, I'm so sick figured, of this, right? You go yeah. out for a week. That's... Yeah, that makes sense. I would probably do yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Um, and then I got pregnant, and my symptoms came back and they didn't come back as badly as they were initially, but it's like the foods that were safe, weren't safe anymore. Yeah. So then I spent the next year trying to figure out what was safe and why I couldn't eat certain things that I've been able to eat before. And that's what eventually led, led me to just eating meat because before prior to the pregnancy, I was able to tolerate basically an extremely limited version of low carb. Yeah. You could eat spinach yeah. and the and the, the leafy greens. Everybody thinks leafy greens are the panacea of health foods, 
but so many people don't do well on them at all. So many people feel, I mean, a lot of people that think they're doing fine, they end up cutting back on leafy greens and they're like, damn, I feel better. So I mean, there, there could be something to this with a lot of people. I'm not, I don't know. I don't know where I am on like vegetables at this point. But I find myself never eating them. <laughs> I don't think that they're bad. You know, I wouldn't – if there's somebody who can eat avocado and eat vegetables every day and they're doing great, they're losing weight, they're feeling better, their depression's gone, it's like why you – don't – you don't have to do it like I do it. There's no point to go super elemental unless you really yeah. need to. So, yeah, that's that's why it's – does your daughter eat uh, any of the foods that you're not really into? Not yet. So she's almost one – and so far we've introduced, she's just breastfeeding and meat. Yeah. When, after she's one, I'm going to start with things like sweet potato and carrots and one at a time very slowly mm. because I'm very paranoid and I don't know what, what, how much of this is genetic. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just do things very slowly, but I'm not going to keep her as restricted as me because, well, I think it's more probably more dangerous to do that than to not do that but she's definitely not eating sugar or grains yeah. or gluten or dairy yeah <laughs> what about yeah. butter how do you do with butter i can't do butter yeah. i can't do dairy at all wow no butter i love butter i would miss it yeah yeah i don't even care anymore tallow i used though. to miss things you like tallow <laughs> you get jars of tallow um i keep my own Cool. So kind of like we get fat from a butcher and make that into yeah. tallow. Yeah. You ever make pemmican with it? You dry the meat and then you dry yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. I actually have made pemmican. Yeah. I have some in the freezer. I love pemmican. You know, you don't even need to freeze it. We used to keep it just on our counter for months and we never got a react. You can keep it out. Do you have a way to make it so it doesn't crumble? Yeah. Jessica? I'll see if she'll, or maybe afterwards she can give you some tips. She's got she uh she did pemmican obsessively for like a couple of years. We got to the point of doing we would dry liver and heart and put it in the pemmican because you can you can't even tell it just gives it a little bit of a rich flavor. Oh, so that's kind that's of a way cool. that people you know we give it to people who would have never thought to eat those foods right you know maybe people who are like yeah I'm, I don't you know I, I eat meat but it's so gross to touch it you know that 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 kind of yeah line. yeah yeah. Which is so sad, right? Especially if you've got kids, like, or if you know, if you've had an autoimmune condition or something, people they get pushed into a corner and they're like, "Well, I'll, I'll eat meat, but I still feel guilty about it." You know, I still, you know, they've been gaslit into this like shame of it. Um, yeah, yeah. Hey, Jessica, I'll, I'll call her at the end. I can't just sit here screaming for my wife during the <laughs> since we're doing this live. But uh, yeah, the the pemmican's cool. I think it has to do with when you pour the fat into the. Uh, and, and the level of fat to powder, right? So yeah. how do you make yours? Uh, well, I've been drying like round roast. Mm -hmm. So drying that till it's super, super dry yeah. and then putting it into a food processor till yeah. it's powder and then pouring fat in. But what happens with mine is, first of all, I probably haven't been making it powdery enough. So I have to actually make it into a powder mm. instead of like, crumbs yeah the crumbs are kind of lame and then yeah so i think that was the problem and that's why it's not sticking together i'm still eating it and it sticks together when it's frozen but it doesn't stick together if it's not frozen yeah we used to have to uh, we haven't made it in months but we'd have to cut it you know we'd have to like sit there and then yeah. like, push it down through and sometimes it would crumble a little bit um but yeah yeah pemmican's cool we uh i'll, I'll call jessica in after this we'll end this soon uh, all right, I want to get into the fertility thing. Before you came on, we were talking about like native practices and fertility. We were going through. Have you ever have you ever seen this book, uh, Physi Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, from Weston A. Price? No. You should really get this book. It's great. You find a used copy somewhere. Weston A. Price. He started the American Dental Association, and he was trying to figure out why are all these friggin' people so messed up? Why is everybody's teeth falling out? Why do kids have dental caries? Why are their jaws narrow and their teeth crowding? When you, if you look at these native populations that are not eating our Western diet, they're fine. They have fully formed faces and they have no crime <laughs> and they don't need doctors and they're not dying of cancer. So he goes and he tries to figure out what is the common thread. And he ends up finding that all of them are using animal fat heavily, especially in periods like before fertility. 
Um, yeah. And he, and he finds that they do, they all use some sorts of plant foods too. Uh, but when you remove the fat from – like there was some Swiss. And as soon as they pull out the milk fat and they gave them the skim milk and the wheat, they started getting tuberculosis and their face would crowd up. So he just he, – he ended up seeing that like wow. all these people were eating animal fats and like shellfish and the, and the coastal areas. Here in, in Ecuador, they use – I, was, I had these. I don't just carry these around. Um, this thing, how weird is that? Insert dirty joke here. But like this thing is a, uh, this is an egg. It's called an anjalote and it's just an egg. It smells really fishy. It's an egg from a skate. And in the Andes, there's not a lot of iodine. So they would trade for these for the coastal people and they would eat this stuff to get more iodine in for fertility up here. So there's just like all these funny practices. Wow. And none of them, unfortunately, for... The people that like to comment on my videos and tell me that I'm bald and ugly. Sorry, guys. I, I still have hair. I just cut it short. And if you think I'm ugly, that's fine. It's all good. Um, but yeah, the, the, those people <laughs> were always – like I, they seem to think that soy is the greatest panacea of health and that leafy green vegetables are. But all these cultures were using animal fats. And isn't it funny? Like were you trying to get pregnant when, you, when your daughter <laughs> – No. No, I definitely wasn't. Right. Um, she's wonderful, though. <laughs> right? I mean, but, what? how uh, amazing. It just seems like you have no regrets at all. <laughs> no, no, I don't. I don't. But um, no, I wasn't. And I read the other day I was looking into, I don't know where, why I came across it, but it was Inuit practices for pregnancy. Yeah. And so Inuit people generally, people know, survived off of um, like meat and fat. Yeah. Um, but they also had some leafy greens or berries, berries in particular. Yeah, dry berries, but, and they would they would use uh, some seaweeds too. Yeah, mm. but um, during pregnancy, I came across this one paper, and apparently, pregnant women were told to avoid plants for the duration of the pregnancy. <laughs> yeah. Wow, interesting. So that's interesting. Really, yeah. really interesting. And then, consequently, uh, so also North American Indian tribes, they would it would be uh, bone marrow and liver and certain certain organs like adrenal glands, which I've never had the adrenals of an animal. I don't know what to call them here. Um, I'm trying to figure it out. Um, but yeah, they would they would do the organs, and they they had specific like they all had feeding things where they would give a lot of fats, a lot of animal fats from whatever was available hmm. in their area. And um, well, that's crazy. I wonder. I mean, obviously, you weren't worried about fertility before because you weren't trying to have a baby when you I thought you were good. Yeah. I wasn't trying, but I mean, I'd been on, so the immune suppressants I'd been on were Enbrel and Methotrexate, and Methotrexate is a, it's a harsh one, yeah. and I was on a high enough dose for a while that I, it was a, I was taken by injection instead of orally, yeah. and then I was taking it orally for a while, so I wasn't at the age to think about it, but it was definitely a concern just because of how sick I was and some of the medications I'd been on for a long time. Yeah. So you thought like, yeah. man, if I ever want to have kids, I wonder if I'm going to be screwed up. Yeah. Yeah. Mostly that. I, I, a lot of people send us emails and stuff. We've been doing kind of a series um, on like this this book and, you know, something when you, when you look at this book, you start to realize, wow, this is kind of every single one of these healthy cultures is doing the opposite of what we're told to do. Like we're told – women are told to avoid liver because it has vitamin A for pregnancy. Oh, yeah. True. But there's a page in this book, if you deprive pigs of vitamin A, you can make them be born blind and without eyes. And this doctor showed that, and there's pictures. I'll show you. I'll see if I could. I had it marked. I took a few notes. <laughs> um, this book is really cool. I think you'd like it. Just, I mean, it seems like you've been researching similar things. So here's a pig. Yeah. Here's pigs born without their eyes. And if they gave one. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's horrifying. <laughs> he did like six litters of these pigs. Uh, oh my god! I'm never gonna be able to unsee that. 1935, and uh, yeah, so they people were studying this stuff, and it seems like it was well known back then by a few of these doctors. And, and Weston Price ended up having um, his theory basically was like there's certain fat soluble vitamins that most of us are being very deprived of, and it's destroying our health, it's destroying our ability to thrive, and it's making us have really crap teeth. Um, so yeah, the, ch check wow. out that book. I think you'd like it. Uh, you can find a PDF online too, but it's it's nice if you can find an old copy. I just spent I because I've destroyed mine, <laughs> so I got a new copy coming. It was like eighty bucks, but I'm excited. It's like a, a '70s copy of it. It was 1939. This book came out, 
Um, wow. I think it's one of the coolest books on nutrition and anthropology of the last hundred years because most of these people, their, their societies are kind of gone now. Like they're all, yeah, they're dead. This was the last, like he, he went to the Inuit and it was well known that the Inuit were degrading at the time, like their health was going down. And the people who comment on my videos uh, who hate me, uh, the, the the vegan enlightened crew, they the the vegan uh, what do they call them the vegan vasectomy crew. We'll call them from now on because vasectomies are a, are a like kind of a sacrament in the this religion of theirs. Um, they tell me that the Inuits are degenerating; they're super poor in health. But Weston Price found that. Yeah, that's true, but he found people that were not poor in health, and those were the only ones that weren't trading for the modern foods, the ones that oh, were living man. off their native diet. Yeah, what's happened? Yeah, that's really sad. The the What I had read was from the 70s, and somebody had gone in and talked, spoken with the elders, and the elders had told them what their practices used to be with, like, you know, staying at home to have birth, obviously, and what they used to eat and things. And at that time, which was the 70s, it didn't exist anymore. People went to hospitals and people didn't eat like that anymore. And it's just, it's gone. And yeah. that's horrible. Yeah. We missed a sad. lot. Like even trying to find a pemmican recipe. Like, yeah, you can't talk to anybody about trying to find a pemmican recipe. And so we're, we've lost so much important information yeah. because of that. It's sad. And it's just ancestral knowledge too, you know, here in Ecuador, um, you know, we've got, you have foods like this, and these are still available in the markets all throughout the Andes, and they were trading wow. these to the coast, and they would trade the alpaca furs and stuff like that uh, from their from the animals. So animal husbandry combined with you know natural foods from the from the oceans and fish and seafood. Um, I think when you look at it, it's kind of the only way. Like people talk about sustainability, right? You know, but that's that's the really only way to sustain populations and actually keep them healthy. You don't want a bunch of sick people eating wheat and soy. Yeah. You want healthy, yeah. happy people who don't have to be on antidepressants. Like how many blogs, how many, how many vegan vloggers out there are talking about their battle with depressions? Uh, it, it's insane, you know. So I, I think it's really important that people understand basic nutritional principles. I think your story is awesome. Of like, you thought that you were dying, you started eating a bunch of meat, and you accidentally got pregnant. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Or it's like most people that are trying to get pregnant now can't even conceive. Like conception's hard now. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, it's been a ride. It's too bad though that the diet that helped me has to be as unbelievable as I only eat beef and now my autoimmune disorder is cured. Like if that if if it was ten years ago and that mm. had popped up on my news feed, I would literally just scroll past it. Yeah, that's like really dumb. Somebody's trying to kill me <laughs> by this article. This is somebody's yeah. trying to literally kill us with this crap. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's unfortunate, but oh well. Wow. All right. So your your kid was born. How was was um, another thing with native cultures that they found in this book? And he he reiterates this so many times is the ease of childbirth compared to normal populations. How was like the labor and everything? Was it a good birth? It was so good. Uh, I did wow. a home birth because at what? that point I was, <laughs> I was really mad about at hospitals uh, and doctors because food was my problem and I have a hip and ankle replacement, which I can never come back from really. So I'm still not very happy with the whole medical community, but I was really worried that part of my problems stemmed from the fact that I was born through a C-section. So I was scared I was going to go to a hospital and lose control and things were going to happen that were out of my control. So I said, okay, I'll just do it at home. Hopefully it'll, <laughs> hopefully it'll go well. <laughs> we live like five minutes away from the hospital. So it wasn't, it, it wasn't dangerous or anything. And it went extremely well. Like for the first, I started getting contractions around 11 in the morning and I wasn't even convinced that they were contractions until 3 PM or four. And then I was like, okay, this is real. We should go home. Cause I was at my parents at that point. Yeah. Uh, and then at like, I, then I got really worried that we were going to run out of food because I couldn't, we can't order food. So this was before <laughs> the carnivore diet, but I really want eat, wanted chicken wings. Nice. So we drove around to like Loblaws, but <laughs> there were a bunch of Loblaws they were out of chicken wings. I don't know. I was very hormonal and I was yeah. very concerned about the chicken wings. Give me my chicken we wings. Had, <laughs> we, had, we had to like on the way home, eventually my husband was like, that's it. We're going home. 
<laughs> on the way home, we had to like pull over because I had a really intense contraction and I was like, there can't be any bumps. Like You're like squeezing <laughs> his arm. He's like, I can't drive. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> oh, so man. we got back and then um, like the intense part of the labor really lasted from 11 until 3 in the morning. And it was, it was good. That's so awesome. What, what, how amazing, you know I mean? That's, that's congratulations. We're, st- I'm stoked to hear you did a home birth. We had, both our kids were born in this house. Our son was born right out that side of that door and we, we didn't even have a midwife. We're so crazy. It was just me and my wife and our daughter was there. It was like this little secret miracle that we only, it's just amazing. Like, it's so cool. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, that's really so cool. awesome. So you, you know, I mean, all, so much propaganda out there telling us we need, to be in the hospital, restrained during the birth process. You need, you know, we're yeah. all these idiot savages. They didn't have drugs, but you know, the these Native American women would just go pop a squat next to a tree alone and come back with the baby, and it's like all good. All right, guys, here you go. You know, they, they really, really didn't have to be such a big deal. That's amazing. And your daughter, yeah. your daughter yeah. seems really healthy. How's how's she oh, doing? Oh yeah, oh she's amazing. Yeah, she's yeah, she's thriving. She. She's great. We have absolutely no problems. There you go. She likes eating meat. Oh yeah, yeah. She'll she'll eat as much as she wants to eat, and so she's just like finger eating now. Yeah. And then when she gets full, she'll throw it on the floor. She just won't put it anymore <laughs> in her mouth. She'll just throw it on the ground. But she's eating like she, a surprising amount now. Um, and I think she's Thanks. starting to wean, so we'll see how that goes. But it seems like she's drinking a lot less during the day. Maybe you're just wishful thinking that she wants to drink less than that. <laughs> that could that could easily be it. Yeah. Dude, Ryder wakes up in the middle of the night and just like wants to gnaw on some booby. He's crazy. I know. She's still. How old is he? Uh, almost two. Oh my. God. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, no, but we, I I don't know. I mean, it's some parents wean at a year and they have no problems at all. I think they'll they'll keep drinking and they'll use that as. <sighs> As a, a mommy button to push, you know, it's like, I need a movie. It's like, yeah. it's like, oh yeah. And you distract them with something else and they're suddenly not hungry. So, um, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I haven't, I haven't tried it all. She's still nursing at three in the morning. Wow. I think the, the, in the live chat right now, every really nice things are being said. I'm not even having to moderate it at all. It's great. People are very positive. Just like. So, you know, people are saying that they're stoked. They're really inspired by the home birth, especially. I think some people's mind was blown. Some people <laughs> say, doc- some, some people say Dr. Peterson's daughter. Come on. I didn't even mention her dad. Who is, so let's, let's talk about your family and how they've kind of adapted, adopted certain practices, uh, mm-hmm. uh, the elimination diet. I think um, <clears throat> a lot of people, there's some funny videos of res- vegan response videos of, Jordan Peterson dared to do the carnivore diet, and I uh, talked about it on Joe Rogan. But um, so you, your dad yeah. started doing it; seemed to help him. Um, oh my God! Yeah. Well, when I when my depression went away originally on the low carb diet, I said I told Dad that he had to get on it, and he was overweight at that time and sleeping all the time, and <laughs> and then he saw the difference it made in me, and it, it was hard to for him to deny that. Yeah. So he went on it, and it just made his anxiety basically worse for like two years and his uh like mental health didn't actually improve until he went he's all beef now too and that happened in april it took a while to convince him to drop the vegetables um but he dropped the vegetables and he so he went from like salad and meat to just meat and now he's just doing beef and he started feeling better in three days yeah so it was really fast for him. It took a little bit longer for me to start feeling better on the, uh, just beef, but for him, it, it was a lot faster. That's so cool. So yeah, I know which makes him just <laughs> crazier sounding, but I, whatever, it's I, worse. It's, also, people need to realize that this is not this is not actually crazy. This is a normal experience yeah. for a lot of people, and a lot of people yeah. don't even realize that the things that they've been living with, the subtle symptoms are not normal. You're not supposed to wake up in pain every day. You're not supposed to need to take a nap three times a freaking day. You're not supposed to be snapping at every single little thing that doesn't go your way. It's not like we're, we're supposed, we can be relatively happy most of the time. 
I'm not saying that it's even healthy to be happy yeah. all the time. Like, we don't have to be, like, grinning, freaking shit-eating idiots all the time. But, you know, I mean, you should be happy, relatively able to deal with stressors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I used to think, like, also, if you if you start having a symptom when you're, like, 12 or 13 and then it never goes away, you basically ignore it. You just think, oh, that's part of me. Yeah. But you shouldn't. Or you shouldn't need a nap, right? Like, People say, oh, I had a really hard day at work, so I need a nap after work. But, like, no, you shouldn't need to nap. Like, <laughs> right? so some, some of those things, like, yeah, people ignore because they've had them for so long. I think a lot of people come to this from a, a place of illness and realize that they're not getting the care they need from the medical world. Like, I grew up with asthma and allergies, back pain, and I tried so many different things. And then I try to like a vegan diet and and everything got way worse <laughs> it was like but i thought that this was a detox you know i think that's another thing Pe yeah people yeah. think that detox is supposed to continue happening for a year or two i don't know about that um maybe a couple weeks of like no. your, your gut clearing out but de you shouldn't be bleeding from your eyes you know from your <laughs> fruitarian diet like you shouldn't be having schizophrenic hallucinations for detox i think that might be a nutrient deficiency in some people uh yeah no i i think it should take max six weeks mm -hmm. i mean i i was in the category of very sick people yeah. and if you don't see improvement after a month because there are like the first two weeks can be rough especially if you're doing something like giving up sugar and carbs like your body's going to constantly just think about carbs for a while yeah. but if it's been a month and you still feel crappy then there's something you still need to fix it's not a waiting game that's what i've seen anyway yeah so it took you like a year to convince your dad what about your mom mom was open to any idea right away super supportive. i guess I, I went on the carnivore diet and i was like well maybe that would help because she had uh, osteoarthritis and i was like maybe that would help your knees and she was like okay <laughs> that's so cool so, my mom was down yeah. and dad he, he was probably working really hard skeptical. at the time yeah very he's, yeah well he's I, just I, skeptical yeah yeah it seems like that's his that's kind of his thing the skeptic oh yeah he was never into diet yeah. he was like no diet has basically nothing to do with anything he did cut out like dessert for a while trying to lose weight but it didn't help yeah so yeah he he was not interested in looking at diet at all but now he's <laughs> now he's a, he's a, the carnivorous heretic would you yeah. say would you say that you saved your father from the abyss zing no, oh I'm, kidding. My. <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm gonna i'm gonna tell him that tonight <laughs> oh should. i totally did i'm gonna i'm gonna use that you should yeah you gotta bring it up really I can't subtly i haven't that already it's like dad you haven't really thanked me yet yeah it's yeah, like, yeah. It's like for oh what? he's thanked me well but you, oh you gotta I'm you gotta do something that. like you didn't thank me today <laughs> or something yeah yeah there's yeah. got to be a way that you could make you could really get a good laugh out of him with that one because it sounds like you did you kind of saved his ass in certain ways i mean look look how hard the guy works oh, how yeah. many freaking podcasts and uh you know live events he was traveling recently right like all over the place oh, yeah no he's traveling yeah he's booked solid it's, it's crazy the amount of work he does but and it wouldn't be sustainable if he had to sleep or if he was tired or if he was as brain foggy as he was before yeah and you, are you're kind of involved do you work with him yeah, I'm doing some of the media requests, like mm -hmm. looking through them. The millions of emails that he gets every day? Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, it's right been on. interesting. Yeah, I'm strange. sure. I'm sure, yeah. What a, what a weird world. It seems like he's one of the most desired faces in, uh, in the media right now. It seems like every, everybody wants to, to take his message and do something with it these days. It must be a, it must be a difficult position to be in. And uh, you can only imagine that, like, you know, having – good nutrition and being able to deal with the stressors is uh is probably pretty important to him so yeah cool. yeah like good downstream effects too you know i mean you you being able to help him out with nutrition maybe makes him more effective at getting across the message and refining the message that he's trying to uh to put out there so that's oh yeah nice little true maybe a bit little downstream blessings going on there <laughs> That's really good. Maybe. Nice. Maybe. So, so what about the future? What uh, you you said um, for now? You're doing beef. Do you plan on trying any other foods? I heard I heard an interview no. with you. The only interview I heard with you, you said you hate liver. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a huge fan of liver. Yeah. I might try. I mean, the pemmican idea is interesting. Dry it, see. But uh, honestly, I'm feeling really good, so I don't yeah. I don't feel the need. But who knows? Yeah. Um. 
down the line, no. I'm not, honestly, I think I'm stuck with this. Obviously, like, I tried reintroducing olives, pure organic olives, and that went terribly. Like, I had just the same immune response. Not as bad as, like, soy, right. but it was still really unpleasant. Um, what about so, no. olive oil? Have you tried olive oil? No. No, I'm not going to try olive oil if olives didn't work. It yeah. was They were, like, organic olives soaked in olive oil. I'm sure it was the... I, I'm just not going to bother. I don't have any cravings. Like, I don't yeah. miss anything. So I don't even, I don't care. What about, um, how do you cook your steak? How do you cook your meat? Um, I use tallow. Sweet. So I cook everything. So I'm literally just eating beef. Yeah. And if I put anything in the oven, I'm just sticking it in the oven with nothing on it. Nice. Salt? Yeah. A lot of salt? Salt. Yes, a lot of salt. What about magnesium and potassium? Because, you know, a lot of people worry about that. You get a lot of people that go keto and, you know, magnesium, potassium, yeah. keto flu, stuff like that. And then they're like, well, maybe I'll try a more elemental and see if that carnivore diet thing works. Do you ever do magnesium, potassium supplementation or so, anything? So, uh, no, I haven't done any supplementation. I'm getting my micronutrients tested through a naturopath um, Monday. Nice. So I'll have the results in a couple of weeks. So that'll be interesting because I have the test done before the carnivore diet as well. Um, but I haven't done, like, I don't have any symptoms of any type of deficiency. So I haven't right. done any supplementation. Plus, I wanted to see what would happen if I didn't supplement and then I got my micronutrients yeah. tested. For sure. For so, sure. If you don't feel well, deficient, we'll see. super interesting. Well, maybe, maybe after you get the testing done, we can do like a quick, you know, second interview or something we could talk about that because that'd be i'm fascinated with those types of things i really don't i'm not dogmatic i don't care about like you know somebody's labs say this or that it's like really oh you were dying and now you're not dying great <laughs> you know that's what's really amazing to me but that's that's really interesting so um all right uh oh yeah how do you do you do rare medium rare medium rare medium rare okay nice yeah do you find Pretty normal it, yeah I'm all about the rare. I'm, I'm trying not to ju no. trying not to judge you right now is what I'm doing. <laughs> no, and I haven't even switched over. To, I thought maybe I would be more into rare the longer I do this, but I'm still medium rare. Nice. You get any? Uh, you get any like weird hate <laughs> emails and stuff of the people? You like, get any re weird response? Um, most of it's overwhelmingly positive. Like yeah. when I started the blog. Um, I was worried because it sounded so crazy, even to me. Uh, but most of it's been overwhelmingly positive, and there are a lot of people who've had success, so that's really nice yeah. to see. So even if I get the occasional, what are your credentials, and who do you think you are, and how dare you? You're like, I'm not telling you to do this. Things. I'm just telling you what I'm doing. Crazy people. Yeah, I'm just saying this is what worked for me. But then I get a message saying, you know, I was depressed for 30 years, and now I'm off of antidepressants. Thank God. Right. Um, so then that's worth it. So I don't really care about the negative stuff. Yeah. And it there's not much of it. That's so good. Yeah, no, it's, it's incredible seeing how many people are really taking back their lives, really taking back their health. And, you know, it's funny is we get taught one thing and then when you actually look at how healthy people have lived, um, the, the crux of their diet is always animal fats and foods from animals with plants added to it when available, you know, and they'll mm -hmm. use the plants when available if they got seasonal fruit. But, you know, I, I really, I'm so remiss to believe that living in Ontario, Canada, that you should be eating, you know, these pesticide drenched bananas coming exported from the coast of Ecuador here. To me, that just seems like absolute insanity. And um, yeah, I think, uh, well, what about, all right, last question, wild game meat up there. You got like moose, caribou. You ever try some of that? So I did try, I tried bison. I know that's not wild meat, but um, I tried bison and I did, had no, I can't eat chicken. And I don't think I can do fish because dad can't do fish. And I just didn't even bother trying to reintroduce it. But I tried bison and bison was absolutely fine. Yeah. So that was interesting. So I haven't tried like moose, caribou, that kind of thing because it's super expensive and I haven't had the opportunity. So we'll see, but bison went well. But nice. that's that's a ruminant animal too, so yeah. I'm not sure. I, yeah, that would be really cool. To, uh, maybe th maybe that's something you try in the future. Get some uh, some wild uh, game meat from up there. It might. Yes, I it's still it's so close. 
still still eating the eating the grass and eating the herbs. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely more. Uh, I'll, I'll definitely do that. Yeah. I don't think I'm going to go back to any vegetables though. It's just not. Yeah. No not point. worth it. You know, you know what they do here that I like? Uh, donkey fat. <laughs> wow. I, I don't have any I have it in the fridge but it's cool when you get it because it stays liquid at room temperature and it tastes so freaking good um, and they uh, they've been using it medicinally a few hundred years I guess you know I mean it just eats the natural herbs around here and um, it's very expensive it's 12 bucks for like a little um, I think it's a quart well maybe one quart um, but it tastes great and they use it for they actually they say that it's good for when you have a cough or something. They rub it on their kid's chest, um, but you could also eat it really good. I, I find it digests really well. It tastes better than tallow to me even. Um, my daughter, she would beg us for it, and now she doesn't beg us for it anymore because she ate so much of it for like a week. She did that thing. That's funny. They get kid, you're, you're going to trip out when you start giving your kid food. They'll love something for so long, and then they're just like, no, I don't want that. I'm like, are you kidding me? But our daughter will never deny steak. That's what I have found. She will never not ask for steak with butter and salt. She wants that every single day. So it works. Yeah, that's pretty much what Scarlett's eating right now. Nice. Minus the butter and the salt. <laughs> I haven't yeah. salted it yet. Nice. Well, that's good. You know, the breastfeeding plus the meats, that's you're getting, them, getting them all they need. I think liver is a good one for, uh, for introducing early. Like That was one of the oh, first foods that Ryder ate. You was... should eat that. Dude, Ryder, that'd be interesting. Ariana used to beg us for raw liver. Oh. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna have to get him for that. Well, I mean, yeah. If you don't like it, it's hard to feed. Eat. It could be hard to feed your kid something if you don't like it. But Ryder would beg for it. He loves that stuff. And um, Ariana loves raw heart. She's constantly telling us, "Don't cook the heart. I want to eat it raw." So we started giving that to her. She, her teeth just started falling out of her face. Uh, we were vegan before we got. Uh, before my wife was pregnant, and uh, she started getting dental caries, which led us to oh, yeah. reading this book. Um, so we were like, well, what are we doing wrong? We're eating quinoa and lentils, and we're doing all these, you know, we're, we're taking B12, and we're doing all this stuff. What's going on? Um, and her teeth started rotting out of her face. So uh, but it stopped, and he shows this in the book too, with uh, kids with nutritional deficiencies, dental caries. He could stop it by giving them stuff like cod liver, um, liver, uh, vitamin A, vitamin K2, vitamin D rich foods which are just fatty wow. cuts of meat and animal-based wow. foods and butter and stuff. So, yeah, we started giving her raw heart as a kid, and she loved it. She would prefer it raw to cooked. And same with liver. She would prefer it raw to cooked. Now she doesn't ask us for raw liver because she just, you know, I mean, she's six now. And um, so she has all sorts of different, you know, ways of controlling us. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Well, this has been wow. great. This has been great. Where can people find your stuff? And, um yeah, where, where can they find you? Um, I have a Facebook page, which is just The Carnivore Diet. I have a blog. Uh, it's called Don't Eat That, but the website's MichaelaPeterson.com. Great. And I'm on Instagram. That's Michaela Peterson too. That's so cool. All right, so I'll put some links down below. I'll put a link to your website and a link to uh, – uh, I guess well, because Instagram, I guess the link doesn't work for Instagram. I'll do the, the stuff that I'm supposed to do. I'll put a link below to your website, and um, thanks a lot for coming on. Everybody on the stream, this has been another little episode of Eat Meat and Make Families. Guys, go take back your lives. Take responsibility. Don't blame someone else. And stop letting your culture be degenerated by a bunch of degenerates. See you next time.